Humans are living souls, nephews in the Hebrew, little bundles of desires. Pleasurable desires can tempt us into sinning. May seem the act itself passes very quickly, but uh, fleeting pleasures can have devastating long-term consequences. Proverbs 20:17. This food gained by a fraud tastes sweet to a man, but he ends up with a mouthful of gravel. Sexual desires are some of the more potent temptations, often with the most devastating consequences. A bit of humor, though, to start. A woman summoned for jury duty said to the judge, Your Honor, I can't serve on a jury. I don't believe in capital punishment. The judge said, Ma'am, this isn't a capital charge, so that doesn't matter. This is a case where a husband emptied out the wife's savings account of $14,000 to take a three-day weekend with his girlfriend in Las Vegas. <laughs> the woman said, Okay, I'll serve. And I could be wrong about capital punishment. <laughs> <laughs> but sexual desires run amok in real life are <coughs> no laughing matter. One of the most famous comedians of the last half of the 20th century was Bill Cosby. Even a, a long running family values based sitcom that was well loved by many. A CBC News item notes Bill Cosby admitted in 2005 that he secured quaaludes with the intent of giving them to young women he wanted to have sex with. And then he gave the sedative to at least one woman and other people, according to documents obtained Monday by the Associated Press. Cosby, 77, has been accused by more than two dozen women of sexual misconduct in episodes dating back more than four decades. What an awful way to wrap up one's career. Later, it's confirmed that Cosby's statue, uh, shown here in the picture, was removed from a place of honor at Disney World's Hollywood Studios theme park. From distinguished to disgraced as a result of one's indiscretions. Church leaders can fall prey to sexual temptation as well. In June, Christianity Today reported that Billy Graham's grandson, Tully Tavidian, here on the left, who had succeeded D. James Kennedy at Fort Lauderdale's Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, resigned as a result of having an affair. He said that his wife had an affair, and in response he sought comfort in a friend, and their relationship turned inappropriate. Chavidjan stated, Both my wife and I are heartbroken over our actions. We ask you to pray for us and our family, that God would give us the grace we need to weather this heart-wrenching storm. Sinful desires may be delightful for a moment, but bring heartbreak and terrible consequences in the long run. So we continue our series looking at how David deals with difficulty. We come to one of the sorriest chapters in the life of Israel's greatest king. So we come to 2 Samuel 11. It seems David's fortunes have finally turned. He's had a long string of victories over Israel's former foes. He's no longer running as a refugee from King Saul. Politically, the northern and southern areas have been unified under his leadership. He's at the point where he can finally start to kick back and relax, as it were. But that's partly the problem. Enter opportunity for trials of a different sort, not pain, but pleasure. He allows his wiring to run roughshod over God's word. We won't go into much detail over the Bathsheba incident itself. We've covered it before. To summarize, let's ask... How many of the Ten Commandments did David's initial sin lead him to end up breaking? To start off, there's the sin of adultery. Commandment 7 of 10, Exodus 20:14, You shall not commit adultery. Second like Samuel 11. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept over. He could have simply looked away. But no, he deliberately pursued another man's wife. Even though 3 verse 2 on shows that he already had at least how many wives? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. He already had 6 wives at least. The ninth commandment, Exodus 20:16, says, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. 
Now, David is very deceptive, tricky, and manipulative in 11, 7 to 13. He brings Bathsheba's husband Uriah back from the front. Uriah is actually one of David's elite soldiers or mighty men, one of the 30. Repeatedly, David tries to get Uriah to go home and sleep with his wife, thus to cover up David's indiscretion. But Uriah is more honorable than his master. He refuses to take it easy when all the rest of the troops are far from home at war. David even gets him drunk, yet Uriah sticks to his principles when it comes to sleeping arrangements. David's falseness isn't working. So the next commandment David breaks is the sixth. Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. 2 Samuel 11, 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. And then he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. Such grim irony to make the man himself unknowingly the bearer of his own death warrant. But David is determined to cover up this evil deed. Not coveting your neighbor's wife or property is the tenth commandment, another one David breaks. 2 Samuel 11, 27. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The eighth commandment forbids stealing. In a way, this is what David was doing as Nathan draws a parallel by his story of the rich man taking his poor neighbor's sheep instead of his own to prepare a meal for a guest. Exodus 20:15, you shall not steal. Second Samuel 12, 4. Nathan saying, Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. He outright stole it. This is also the emphasis in God's rebuke to David through the prophet Nathan in 12, verse 9. It says, You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. <clears throat> so far, David's dalliance has impacted mostly the horizontal dimension, human relationships. Uh, of the Ten Commandments, we talk about numbers 5 to 10 of that list. But those commandments governing the vertical dimension, the relationship to God, are affected here too. Particularly, command number 1, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Also number two, Exodus 20, verse 4, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. <coughs> as the rebuke by prophet Nathan reveals, God views David's sin as primarily against God, and only secondarily against Uriah and his wife. Nathan thunders, speaking for the Lord, 2 Samuel 12, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. God's honor, God's reputation and glory <coughs> are at stake way we behave. I'll say that again. God's honor, God's reputation and glory are at stake in the way we behave. We reflect on him, either for credit or dishonor, to desire forbidden things. For David to lust after that beautiful woman bathing is to despise God, reject his word and promises, show contempt for his loving goodness and all he's done for us. Know what God says through Nathan, recounting all the ways he's blessed David in 12 verses 7 on. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you, your master's wives and your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Living translation. I would have given you much, much more. By desiring the forbidden thing, David missed out on the much, much more with which the Lord would have been delighted to bless him. By sinning with Bathsheba, he settled for the bad deal. 
God wants us to trust Him, to know and give Him what's best for us. Not just the passing pleasures that appeal to our flesh. Don't let the tempter trick you into the worst deal. <laughs> Psalm 51 was written by David as a result of Nathan's rebuke. Let's look at some of these verses in Psalm 51. Against you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight, so that you, God, are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Pure heart equips us to have holy desires, what's pleasing, not evil, in God's sight. And we can see various stages in God's disciplining of David after he blows it. Discipline is no fun. Punishment is painful. Discipline is tough. It helps us become tougher with ourselves so we don't mess up in the same way next time, hopefully. A school teacher injured his back and had to wear a plaster cast around the upper part of his body. It fit under his shirt and wasn't noticeable at all. On the first day of the term, still with the cast under his shirt, he found himself assigned to the toughest students in school. Walking confidently into the rowdy classroom, he opened the window as wide as possible and then he busied himself with desk work. When a strong breeze made his tie flap, he took the desk stapler and stapled the tie to his chest. He had no trouble with discipline that term. In David's case, Nathan the prophet opens with a story from a pasturing scenario that would have drawn the shepherd king right into it before delivering the tough message he as a sinner needed to hear. A rich man needlessly and heartlessly stealing a poor man's darling pet lamb to feed a wizard. Verses 5 to 7. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. There is a place for rebuke in the Christian church. Without accountability, without caring, loving voices calling us back to holiness, we wander. We need each other for rebuke, always grounded in the common reference point of God's word. Jesus commanded in Matthew 18.15, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Paul told the Galatians, 6 verse 1, uh, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Well, there's this role of rebuke. I hope we can have a loving, caring fellowship that we can be open with one another. And when the, these tough times come, we've got to go and talk to somebody. There's enough love bond there that we take it the right way and we can help each other out that way. David responds with repentance, not trying to excuse or justify himself, but accepting God's view of his evil actions. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Simple acknowledgement he had blown. Psalm 32, 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Come clean with God. Admit you've transgressed and crossed the line here according to his definitions and categories, not the world's. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. While undergoing discipline, David humbles himself. As Nathan prophesies, David and Bathsheba don't die as a result of their sin, although the penalty under the law of Moses was death for both adultery, Leviticus 20.10, and for murder, Leviticus 24.17. They both deserve to die twice over. But the baby they conceived together dies a week later instead. David humbled himself, interceding for the child to be spared. 
2 Samuel 12, 16. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted, went into his house, and spent the nights lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him out from the ground, but he refused. He would not eat any food with them. After the child dies, as predicted, David surprises his officials. 2 Samuel 12, 20. Then David got up from the ground. After he'd washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. This is the goal of discipline. God bringing us back to himself, into relationship with the Holy One. When we've been rejecting him and wandering away. We remember God is God, not us. Respect, honor, submit to him. Hebrews 12, 9. We have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? And you're asking, be subject to, maybe be, be under the authority. Now, those words are kind of anathema to our culture. The worship's freedom, independence, doing your own thing. Finally, this whole process of rebuke and repentance leads to restoration. God reaffirms us as his children, reconciled to him through the blood of Christ, shed the cross for us sinners. Verse 24 and on. And David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. Because the Lord loved him, he sent words from Nathan the prophet, named him Jedediah, which means loved by the Lord. What a beautiful name. Believe it or not, discipline is one of the ways God shows he loves us. A caring parent teaches and disciplines their daughter so they learn not to burn their hands on a hot stove or get run over by a car by darting them into the road. Discipline is, a, is an essential part of parenting. Through the painful process of discipline, God trains us in holiness so we grow in righteousness, reflecting him more. A great passage in Hebrews 12 here. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good. We may share in his what? Holiness. His holiness. That's the goal. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest, righteousness, and peace for those who have been trained by it. David desired Bathsheba and despised God's word. Better would be a beautiful woman who delights in God's word and shares his ways with others. Tony Campolo tells of an encounter with a beautiful woman on an airplane flight that had a happier outcome than David's flame. Tony Campolo says, The effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one witnessing became clear to me one day when I was on an airplane heading to Orlando, Florida. I was scheduled to speak at a huge outdoor festival that would bring together thousands and thousands of young people to hear the gospel. So I sat in my seat, I looked across the aisle, and saw sitting by the window in the seat opposite me one of the most attractive women I had seen in a long, long time. I don't want to sound sexist, but I have to say she was stunning. Coming up the aisle of the airplane was a very New York-looking guy. He was wearing a satin shirt with the top three buttons undone. This allowed us to clearly see evidence of his hairy chest covered by some golden chains. There is an arrogance to his step. It was an almost empty airplane, and I had a pretty good idea as to where he would choose to sit. And I was right, he sat next to that beautiful woman. What followed was more than entertaining to watch. He did all the things that a guy like that does when he moves on a woman. When he had her thoroughly engaged in conversation, I watched her smile at him as she reached into her pocket book and pulled out a New Testament. For the next two hours, she had the scriptures open and was explaining to him what the gospel story was all about. The plane landed and we pulled up to the exit ramp. People stood and began to get their belongings out of the overhead compartments. As then I saw that the one-time makeup man had his head bowed and eyes closed. 
His new friend had her hand on his shoulder, and she was praying for him to accept Jesus as his Savior. Uh Taking in that scene, Mm -hmm. Paul concludes, I thought to myself, who am I kidding? In the end, it's that kind of evangelism, not my preaching, that does the most for spreading the message of the gospel. 